So I'd like to say thank the organizers uh, for putting together this program and uh, for giving me the opportunity to tell you about some of the research we've been doing uh, where part of its goal is to look at hydrodynamics in solids. I think the, the lectures that I prepared will have a slightly different flavor from the ones that you've heard up to now, primarily because they will not solely be focused on hydrodynamics. Uh, since this is a school, what I thought I would do is actually uh, give these lectures uh, with, in the context of developing an experimental program. I know that half of you are experimentalists. You might need to develop such a program at, so, at some point. And also for the theorists, I think knowing what are some of the difficulties and limitations associated with working towards an experimental goal might be of interest. So I'd like to start with giving some motivation for this uh, experimental program. Uh, and um, let me say that over the past decade or so, condensed matter physics has really been presented with some new and fundamental challenges that require uh, development of new experimental tools uh, in order to address some of these challenges. And I'd like to give several examples. Um, so let's start with various uh, ground state properties of systems. So if we take, for example, uh, spin systems, spin over the past decade has really been uh, playing a front and central role, uh, and in particular the role of spin orbit that I'll mention uh, a couple of times. Uh, so, for example, we're becoming familiar with systems that are known to have what's called skirmionic order. This is uh, magnetic order. These are m m textured magnets where uh, the system is neither ferromagnetic nor anti-ferromagnetic. Uh, on short length scales, the spins want to be aligned. But on long length scales, actually, they want to be anti-aligned. And uh, the challenge here is that the length scales over which these magnetization patterns develop are not on the atomic scale and they're not macroscopic either. They're in the tens of nanometer scale. And so our conventional tools for looking at magnetization, for example, neutron scattering, uh, will fail in these systems because the length scales are very different from the wavelength of neutrons that you can easily generate. Uh, additionally, some of the systems that exhibit these phenomena are not even ordered. So whereas these are images made out of Lorentz microscopy, certain uh, type of transmission electron microscopy. Um, in certain systems, you can have skirmions where the underlying material is amorphous. And so these techniques will not work at all. So the challenge here is really to develop a tool that will allow you to see some of these magnetization textures in this intermediate length scales. Another interesting challenge in the ground state properties of systems exist in, for example, topological insulators. So here is an example of a two-dimensional topological insulator where the system is gapped in the bulk, but it has edge states. And the property of these edge states is such that they are counter-propagating and carry opposite spin. And what this means is that, obviously, there is no net orbital or charge current in equilibrium in the system. But there is a spin current that is flowing here in equilibrium. And the question is, how can we know that such a spin current exists? Can we develop a tool that would allow us to say, oh yeah, there is a spin current flowing here at the edge in equilibrium in steady state? So that's another challenge in, um, in steady state ground state properties. Another example of a challenge has to do with volume of materials. So here's uh, a specimen of graphene where under certain conditions, for example, we know uh, in the presence of strong magnetic fields, it is believed to develop an antiferromagnetic order. So the challenge here is that, uh, and the antiferromagnetic order will be on the atomic scale. So in principle, conventional techniques should be able to see it, but the volume of this material is so small. The flake is of order of a micron in, in length scale, and it's one atomically thin sheet. And so we don't really have any technique that can directly observe this magnetization order in the system. And the magnetization densities in these systems will be something like six order of magnitude smaller than magnetization densities you'd find in conventional magnets. So here again, there have been indirect ways of observing such uh, th these specific phases, but 
Uh, they're all inferred indirectly, and it would be really nice to develop a tool that will actually be able to image and see this magnetization order uh, in such a flake. And of course, I encourage questions. Uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt. Beyond the ground state properties, one could ask, well, what about excitations? So excitations exist above the ground state of a system. And here again, we're presented with some fundamental challenges uh, in the past several years. And I'm just giving here two examples. Uh, one are spin liquids. These are materials that are very frustrated. They're frustrated magnets in which uh, the type of interaction or ordering that the system wants to develop between neighboring pairs is uh, anti-ferromagnetic, namely one up, one down, but in fact they want to order in the form of singlets. So the system has no net magnetization. Uh, and in fact, what is believed to be the property of the ground state of spin liquids is that uh, it is a superposition, a coherent superposition of all possible pairwise singlets that can exist in the system. So this is a very complicated ground state who has no magnetization. It's an insulator typically, so you can't do charge probing through it. And its excitations are believed to be fermionic and carry spin without charge. Uh, and so here, uh, some techniques that have been used to try to explore these things are thermal properties, thermal transport that are carried, energy carried by these excitations. But again, it would be really nice to be able to probe directly the spin properties of these excitations uh, directly. Uh, another example here are spin ice. These are again frustrated magnets where uh, electron spins are organized in these tetrahedra in a way that resembles water ice, namely two spins pointing in, two spins pointing out. Uh, and again, in the ground state, the system is not very interesting. And yet, in the excited state, you can imagine a situation where now the system has three spins pointing in, one pointing out. Uh, these turn out to behave, these excitations turn out to behave as magnetic monopoles. Uh, of course, they can only come in pairs, but they're unbound. So very similar to fractional quantum Hall excitations where an electron will fractionalize into three excitations and the number of these excitations always has to add up to an integer number of electrons, but they're nonetheless free to move and the system is well described in terms of these elementary excitations and their properties. So here again, it would be really nice if we had tools to be able to measure these excitations. Now, going beyond the existence of excitations, one could ask, well, if I already have excitations, what about the transport of these excitations? Uh, so here again, there has been quite a lot of interesting work in the past uh, several years. For example, even in conventional magnetic insulators where the underlying excitations are magnons, and part of what I'll be talking about throughout these two lectures are magnons, uh, it turns out that they have some interesting properties. Uh, for, for example, they have universal transport properties, universal Peltier and Zibe coefficients. Uh, and there are some interesting predictions that I'll talk more about uh, probably in the next lecture that have to do with spin superfluidity. And by the way, superfluidity is yet another form of hydrodynamic transport where conservation laws emerge from spontaneous breaking of symmetry rather than simple just collective behavior of conservation of energy and momentum. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in the, in the second talk. So we're definitely interested in these transport properties of excitation. So not only learning about the existence of their excitations, but driving these excitations, creating chemical potential imbalances. How do we measure these currents? How do we measure the chemical potential of these excitations, etc.? And in relation to these magnons, there is recent work that we are very interested in that have to do with uh, hydrodynamic properties in the sense that we've heard already in the past several lectures, conservation of momentum and energy in magnon systems where, for example, there is an emergent sound mode that develops within the gap of the ferromagnet. So if the, the magnet has a gap due to, let's say, an, a, a symmetry, an isotropy, or a magnetic field, within the gap of this magnet, a sound mode develops uh, at low frequencies and low wave vectors uh, that has never been uh, seen before. So we're definitely interested in building our techniques to get to this point where we can study these type of hydrodynamics in magnonic systems. So overall, I'd say 
what we really need to do is to develop a tool set. Uh, up to now in charge transport there have been tremendous developments in voltage sensors, current sensors, voltage sources, current sources. We need to develop the analogs of these things for whatever excitation we're interested in. Uh, and this is part of the research program that we've been developing over the past uh, several years. So what will come in these lectures? So what I'll do in these lectures is really build towards exploration of magnon hydrodynamics. We're not there yet in terms of probing hydrodynamic phenomena of magnonic systems, uh, but for measuring these magnonic hydrodynamics, you really, since a magnon is basically a fluctuation of magnetization, we broke it up into steps. We started out by looking at static magnetization, then looking at excitations and chemical potential, looking at transport of magnons, and now we're at a point where we can start looking at these hydrodynamics. Uh, of course, since we're not there yet, uh, this part of hydrodynamics will later on be towards the end of the second lecture, or half of the second lecture, I'll talk about hydrodynamics in graphene. This is in fact experimentally much easier to probe uh, because here we're talking about the orbital effect of electronic motion and magnetic fields they're generating in terms of extracting what the current flow patterns are. And I'll spend some time describing what the experiments are and how they relate to some of the theories that you've been hearing, hearing in the past couple, couple of days. Now since this is a, my program here is to really give you a sense of an experimental, uh, an experimental program, what I'll spend quite a bit of time on each topic is to relate the quantity that we know how to measure, specifically in these cases magnetic field, and the physical phenomenon that we're interested in. So for example, we're interested in magnetization, we're measuring magnetic field, what is the relationship? We're interested in a spin chemical potential, we can measure magnetic field, what is the relationship? Normally, experimental techniques or measurement apparatus do not report the quantity that you're interested in. They always report a different quantity, and there's a piece of physics that connects between the two, so I'd like to introduce for each one of these topics, what is that piece of physics that connects the quantity that we know how to measure and the quantity we're really interested in. <coughs> All right. So we are going to uh, be using nitrogen vacancy centers as uh, magnetometers and uh, I'll give a brief introduction to how this technique works, some of their advantages. Uh, you'll see that since we're interested both in static magnetizations, for example, or static current flow, uh, we need to know how to measure static magnetic fields. We also need to measure excitations. These are going to be dynamic properties, so we need to measure also magnetic fields in the time domain. So overall, uh, what we find is this technique is particularly su suitable for measuring magnetic fields both in space and time. And I'd like to describe how we can extract this information from uh, this type of sensor. So this is the nitrogen vacancy center. It's a defect in diamond uh, where you have one carbon atom replaced by nitrogen, the other one by a missing carbon atom. It has an axis and typically one reports, but you'll see this in a little bit, uh, what you're measuring is magnetic field along this axis. You can also measure magnetic field perpendicular to this axis, but it's less sensitive to that. Uh, the energy spectrum, I'm not going to go into the detailed group theory that describes the properties of this defect, uh, but the bottom line is that it can describe can be described by a three-level system, basically a spin triplet, a ground state ms equals zero, and ms equals minus one and plus one. And once you have a finite magnetic field, you can always choose a pair of states to work with, which then maps on to a spin half representation and just the behavior of just a spin half. Now it has some key properties and key advantages, conveniences. One is that you can know whether you're in the ground state or one of these excited states through just fluorescence. Basically shining light on this defect uh, causes this defect to emit light back and the intensity of that light, how many photons are emitted, are directly related to whether you're in the ground state, which is a bright state, versus a dim state, uh, which is one of these two excited states, ms plus or minus one. So if you ended up in this defect with one of these states and you want to know, well, am I in spin zero or spin uh, plus or minus one, you just shine some light and then look at the intensity of the emitted light and you can say, where is it? Yeah. What's the density of this defect? How many are there? 
Uh, most of this talk will be just one. So you have one defect on at the. At I'll talk. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Yeah, we have one defect sitting at the end of our probe. That's how we design these these probes. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, related to that, this means that the sp ultimate spatial resolution of this technique is the size of these defects, which is atomic. Uh, I'll talk more about spatial resolution. Of course, if you really want to see atomic variation of magnetic fields, you need to be atomically close to whatever property you're looking at. But I'll, I'll, I'll have some caveats to say about that as well. Um, another interesting property of this defect is that we know to initialize it. The energy difference here is very small. It's on the order of microkelvin. And in fact, all the experiments I'll be talking about through both talks uh, are room temperature experiments. One, to emphasize that actually there's a lot of interesting physics happening still at room temperature. One doesn't need to cool everything down. But this is quite remarkable uh, that despite the fact that this system is at these energy levels is much, much smaller than KT, nonetheless, we know, again, using optical techniques to prepare this defect in its ground state. And the way that is done is by shining light, a green light, for a long enough time that prepares the system in its ground state. Uh, and I can go into more depth if people are interested, either uh, after the talks or uh, if there is time towards the end. So the way... Affect the decay rate back to... Like if you go to an excited state and decay rate to the ground state, and the temperature affects that? No, the temperature does not affect the decay rates at all. The the uh, presence of phonons or not? Uh, yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly in do, in, in, uh, spontaneous emission okay. um, that, that occurs. Uh, so the, the way we work with this defect is, first of all, we shine light for about a microsecond, some green light. It prepares it in the ground state. We then subject it to whatever magnetic fields we're interested in detecting. This causes this defect to transition from the ground state to one of the excited states. And then we shun sunlight again for a shorter period of time, collecting fluorescence and determining where we ended up. And I'll, I'll describe this in, in a little bit, uh, just a little bit better. All right, so the simplest way to work with this defect to measure static magnetic field is called electron spin resonance, where what you do is imagine we're sitting at some magnetic field that we don't know what it is. Of course, we do know what the g factor of this defect is, so we know what the slope of these lines are, g, pack, g factor of 2. What we'll do is we'll scan a microwave tone, a microwave field, that will try to drive the system, since it's a spin half <coughs> system, from its ground state to one of these excited states. And so as we'll change the frequency, what will happen is that at some point, our frequency will match precisely the energy difference of these two, uh, these two spins. And if we're monitoring fluorescence continuously, as long as we didn't hit the resonance, we're going to see the fluorescence of this NV center being bright because it's all the time in its ground state. But once we hit this point where we're on resonance, the spin will be half of its time in its ground state, half of its time in its excited state, and the fluorescence will dim. And that's what you see. You see a dip in fluorescence. And if you just read out this frequency, you can immediately convert it to a magnetic field with very high precision. The sensitivity, just to give some numbers for this kind of static mode of investigation, is on the order of a few microtesla per root hertz, for one second of integration. Now, one of the advantages of these nitrogen vacancy centers is that you can use techniques of, that are known as quantum coherent techniques, quantum control, in order to enhance the sensitivity. So let's see how this might work. This will also get us a sense of what the sensitivity is of this probe. So this is a two-level system, and so it is described by a block sphere. Uh, and imagine that we, we know how to prepare it along the North Pole. Let's say the ms equals 0 state is pointing upwards, and the ms equals minus 1 will be pointing downwards. Uh, so we'll prepare it in, the excited, in, in its ground state, and then we'll apply a coherent microwave signal that will drive the spin into the equator. It's called a pi over 2 pulse. So now we've created a coherent superposition of the 0 and 1 state. If we now are subject to some magnetic field that we don't know what it is, we just let this spin evolve. 
And so it's going to evolve for some time and acquire a phase. And at the end of the evolution time, which we choose, we're going to project it back onto the 0, 1 axis by rotating it around this axis here and then measuring whether it's up or down. And of course, this is a quantum measurement, so it's a projective measurement. And the uncertainty within each measurement in terms of determining what the evolution phase is, is pi. Because regardless of what we end up, we have some probability of measuring 0, some probability of measuring 1. We're not going to be measuring anything in between 0 or 1, always 0 or 1. So the uncertainty is pi. And of course, by repeated measurements, just by the central limit theorem, we can reduce our uncertainty in the measured phase by the square root of the number of measurements. The signal that we'll collect, that phase itself, is given by the external field omega times the time that we evolved. That's the phase. And so if we want to determine what the signal to noise here is, we need our signal to be of order the noise. And you can immediately see that for a given number of attempts or repetitions, and we can write down what this number is in terms of the total measurement time, let's say one second, and there are minimum times, so we can't repeat this very, very fast because each measurement time has at least an evolution time where we let the system acquire information about its environment. That's the T2. And there might even be some slower processes that have to do with our initialization before we can repeat the measurement. That's this Tm. But nonetheless, there is some number here that uh, will depend on the measurement time and on the evolution time. And that gives us the sensitivity here. And so the longer the coherence in the system, so where this kind of coherent superposition can live, the better the sensitivity. And just to put in some numbers, if this coherence is of order 100 microseconds, which is characteristic, uh, we can get under these quantum control techniques, we can get sensitivities in the few nanotesla per root hertz for one second of integration. So what this allows us is to measure magnetic fields at low frequencies quite precisely. Uh, but now the question is, what happens if we want to measure magnetic fields at some high frequency? So what I'm envisioning is that my environment doesn't just have a static magnetic field, but it has a spectrum of magnetic fields at different frequencies. And this is the spectral density in Tesla per root hertz. It's some, it has some properties. For example, there might be some nuclear spins that are processing at a particular frequency because we're sitting at a given magnetic field. So this gives a dynamic, a time-dependent magnetic field that is generated by the sample. So it turns out that there are even more sophisticated ways of measuring these AC fields. And I'd like to, again, give you just the flavor. So up to now, we've done the first three steps here, which was prepare, uh, flip into the equator, and let evolve for some time. Imagine now that we add another pulse, a pi pulse, around this axis here, which will flip this spin onto the upper opposite side. And we let it evolve again for precisely the same time. So here we evolve from 0 to tau. Here we evolve from tau to 2 tau. Note that regardless of how much we evolved, we will always end up by this sequence on the other side. If we start from the left side, regardless what the phase phi is, we always will end up on the other side. So this means that this measurement scheme is completely insensitive to uniform magnetic fields. It just cancels it out. So if we're, and that's good, because at this point, we're not interested in static magnetic fields. We want to measure some high frequency magnetic field. So what frequency of magnetic field will be optimal for this particular protocol? Well, it's one that switches sign between the evolution during the first half and the second half. So imagine my magnetic field is a sine wave whose frequency is exactly matched to this evolution tau. So it's given by 1 over tau. And so during the first half, we're evolving and we're accumulating the phase in this positive direction, 5, 1. If we now flip this pi pulse, and now we evolve by phi 1, but in the opposite direction, you see we're not going to be coming back to the original point. We're going to be acquiring a net phase, and that is the phase that we'll be picking up directly in proportion to this particular frequency. So we can lock in specifically on a particular frequency using these specific pulse sequences. And it turns out that one can devise smart pulse sequences that allow us to create filters 
just like a spectral filter that will extract specific frequencies from the full spectral content. So in the frequency range of let's say 10 kilohertz to a few hundred megahertz, we can really carve out specifically by controlling this detector, uh, we can carve out information from the full spectral content of the environmental magnetic field fluctuations uh, using these sophisticated techniques. Now, Imagine that we want to even study fluctuations at higher frequencies. What limits these techniques is the fact that these pulses take time. And if we're looking for something that's really changing very rapidly, either we need to make these pulses extremely short, which is experimentally challenging, or we need to find a different way of extracting magnetic field fluctuations at higher frequencies. So there is yet another modality in which one could work that works up to several gigahertz at least, and this is just relaxation. So remember that the way we're driving these transitions is by a specific microwave field that has a frequency that is resonant with this transition. So if we prepare, let's say, our NV center at the MS equals zero state, and there is some noise in the system that is at the frequency uh, that is resonant with this, suppose we're at some magnetic field. If there is noise in the system at a particular frequency that matches this energy separation, it would lead to relaxation. Even if it's not a coherent tone, it will lead to relaxation. So if we just monitor the lifetime of our envy center as a function of time from each one of the states, either 0, 1, or minus 1, we can extract what this noise in the environment is at precisely that frequency, so it's a very, very narrow spectral sensor uh, that can tell us very precisely on the order of, again, a few nanotesla per root hertz what the time-varying magnetic field at a specific frequency uh, is. Okay, so these are the different modalities and throughout uh, when I describe some of the experiments we'll be using different techniques. I'll try to highlight uh, which one is being used for each, for each one of the measurements. So how do we do these measurements uh, experimentally? Uh, so as Adi was asking, uh, we have uh, developed a way to have a single NV center sitting at the end of, uh, of a probe. Uh, the way we make this is by taking a slab of diamond. These are all monolithic uh, pieces of diamond. We start out with a slab of diamond that's a few millimeters in size, maybe 50 microns thick. We implant nitrogens, so this is a very high purity diamond that has no defects in it, or very, very few. Uh, and we implant nitrogens and convert them through annealing to nitrogen vacancy centers. And we choose the density of these defects, which are stochastic. But the density of these things are such that we have, on average, one per about 100 nanometer. That's how we choose the implantation density. Uh, we then thin the slab. This is at least the previous way of doing it. I'll show you how we do it today. Uh, and then you do some lithography. You need to do it on both sides, thin it from one side, do E-beam lithography on the other side. And you see that when you create now pillars, uh, you see that on average you're going to get one NV center with per pillar because that's how you designed the density. Uh, sometimes you'll get zero, sometimes you get none. Uh, so sometimes you'll get two. But on average you get one. And what we do is we make a macroscopic number of these, hundreds of these, and we characterize them. And the ones that have the properties that are good for us, they have one NV center. We can even choose the orientation. There are four spatial orientations for NV centers. Uh, we can then uh, choose the ones that we like and mount them on a quartz probe uh, to enable scanning. Now, this, uh, this pillar serves several important features. First of all, it serves to be the lowest point so that we can bring this NV center to be very close. By the way, the implantation is such that we can position these defects to be within a few nanometers from the surface uh, with very high degree of control, and we can determine how deep they are through the experiments that we do. Uh, but it also serves to collect light. Diamond is a high dielectric index material, and so it tends to keep the light inside. Uh, we need to collect the light in order to measure this fluorescence to determine the spin configuration of the NV in order to infer what magnetic field uh, we're sensing. And so 
these, uh, these pillars serve also as a waveguide for the light. And you might imagine, well, what is the hardest part in these tips altogether to make them? It's the gluing. This is, you know, making all this is hard. And in fact, it has focused ion beam and it has, you know, many different steps. But just gluing this thing to this pillar in a way that doesn't damage the end here is rel and reliable, this is really the, the lowest yield process. And so we were fed up with this and we moved to a different type. So these are the old ones, these are the new ones. And you see how much more bulky they are. Here is the pillar. So this is a slab that has not been thinned down. Uh, it's 30 microns to begin with. That's how, much, that's how thin we can get it from a cutting uh, a company that cuts diamond. Uh, and uh, we now know to control the taper of these pillars in a very, very controllable manner, which enhances the number of photons by roughly an order of magnitude. So we can get nearly a, mil a million photons per second uh, uh, from one single defect in, in this system. Uh, we've also started to, these, these, uh, these probes are now also compatible with conventional AFM cantilevers that you can buy. Uh, this is a conventional silicon cantilever, and you see it's mounted on top. We've in starting to integrate the microwave drive. So as you've seen, you need to drive these NV centers with microwaves. Uh, so now we can integrate that to be part of the probe. Uh, and so we're making a lot of uh, steps to make our life easy so that we're not spending a lot of time developing these probes, but actually using them. Yeah. yeah. So the, the length of this pillar is about 2 microns. So this is about 100 microns or 50 microns. Mm -hmm. So is the light coming out from the, from the tube? Or no, so the light is, is emitted predominantly upwards, again, because light wants to stain diamond. So it's emitting a little bit in, out of the pillar, mm -hmm. but mostly upwards. Uh, because it's a waveguide, the light then diffracts as it emits, as it comes out of the waveguide, still within diamond, with an angle here that's about 30 degrees, and then diffracts further as it comes out of, out of the diamond, uh, and we collect it with an optical objective at the top. Oh, the waveguide is this pillar. This is a waveguide. It guides the light upwards. Yeah, and the fact that this taper, because it's tapering out, what happens, the optical collimation, so the light that leaves this taper is fairly collimated because you slowly widen it. And this is really important because the more it's collimated coming up, you know, when it's going to come up, because again of the high index, it's going to diffract uh, sideways. And so we need, uh, you know, if, if you don't, you're not careful, you're going to be losing light that you can't collect with your objective above. But this technique really allows us to not struggle too much. We don't need a high NA objective in order to collect the light because it's already fairly collimated. And where do you collect light? Oh, just above. There is an objective here. I, you'll, I might have a, an image somewhere later on that you'll see it. But it's just an optical objective. Uh, and when you say you mount it on an AFM tip, so you glue the diamond on an AFM tip? So you still have a gluing uh, process? Yeah, but this is all macroscopic. This you can do on an uh, optical microscope. This is all easy. You know, we, we can, you know, prepare 10 of these a day. Okay. You don't need any, you know, before it was all done in electron. These were done in electron microscope where you used electron microscope glues. These are glues that you can hardened by shining electrons on them so that you can do it. It's, you know, crazy. This is much, much easier. And then the, the cantilever are pretty long. This is 100 meters. Yeah, so you, ch you choose the cantilevers. So here, specifically, the way you detect is actually not with a tuning fork, but with a, uh, you know, up quadrant. Uh, no, it's not yet. So you diffract light. So you have a laser ah. that comes in from the side, hits okay. this platform, diffracts and the vibration is detected by, uh, or the deflection is detected on the four quadrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that detection is also easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So is the amount of light that's actually coming uh, up dependent on the thickness of the slab? Of the, uh, 
it doesn't depend on the thickness of the slab. And this is, to some extent, you know, was a worry because the emitted light is not monochromatic. Uh, it is um, at a range of colors around 630 nanometers, but it's, 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 it's a very broad range of colors, at least at room temperature when you do these experiments. And so you need to worry about chromatic aberrations so that your optical setup can collect. But the fact that it's fairly collimated helps a lot in not suffering too much from these chromatic aberrations that will depend on the thickness. Okay, chronologically, when we developed this technique, we started by looking at what I'd call non-interacting spins, paramagnetic spins. Our first experiments, for example, was to measure just the magnetic field generated by one electron. It's a very weak magnetic field. Obviously, the eyes is one over distance cube. Uh, here you can see an image of this magnetic field. Here is a line cut. You see that it has a lot of noise. And note how much time we had to integrate each pixel here, 40 minutes. Uh, so the signals are fairly weak for one electron spin. Uh, part of the reason for this long time has to do with the fact that the total distance between sensor and spin here was 50 nanometers. Because the signal goes as distance cube, signal to noise goes as signal to the sixth power, distance to the sixth power. So every factor of two corresponds to roughly two orders of magnitude in, in integration time. So just doing this experiment, 20 nanometers rather than 50 would take a factor of 1,000 faster than what we've done here. So this is just something to remember. Uh, a lot, another point of reference is that previously there have been measurements using magnetic resonance force mic microscopy to measure the magnetic field of one electron spin. Their measurement time per each point was 13 hours. So even though this is long, it's faster than 13 hours. Um, we talked about spatial resolution, and I want to point out if there will be time at the end, I'll say more about this, but spatial resolution is really not only dependent on the distance. Uh, you're all familiar with magnetic resonance imaging. These are systems that exist in hos hospitals. Their detectors sit a meter away from the object that is you're, they're looking at, and yet they have spatial resolution. Their size of the detectors is a meter in size. They're sitting a meter away from the object they're looking at, and the spatial resolution is a fraction of a millimeter. So this kind of law that spatial resolution is set by the distance of the detector is not a law of nature. Uh, here is an example where we were able to measure density of electron spins on the surface of diamond with a spatial resolution that's less than one nanometer where the NV center was sitting something like 30 or 40 nanometers away. And the reason is that uh, if you can control or drive the system that you're interested in, and here we have some RF that we're driving continuously. And what we're doing is we're moving a magnetic field gradient across the sample with another tip. What happens is that this magnetic field gradient differentiates the spins in space and only puts into resonance a very, very narrow slice. And those spins that are processing are the ones that I'm detecting. The distance only sets the signal but not the spatial resolution. Governing the spatial resolution is the magnetic field gradient here of order 10 to the 6 tesla per meter. In conventional MRIs, it's of order 10 tesla per meter. So about five orders of magnitude stronger gradients can be achieved on short length scales on the order of 100 nanometers. So here, this was a full three-dimensional magnetic resonance imaging reconstruction of spin densities in a solid. Uh, where the spatial resolution is not at all dependent on the distance. For interacting spins, which is most of what we'll be talking about, this is hard to do because I can't flip one spin out of the entire lattice of spins because the energy to do that is an electron volt. So that becomes hard. I need to create magnons, if you will, of that energy. Uh, and that's becoming hard. So then the spatial resolution will approach the distance. But I just want to point out that you know, if you're clever, you can figure out ways in which you can improve spatial resolution uh, simply by doing some clever drive techniques and not suffering from this distance law. So what's the DC magnetic field limits on the operation of the NV center? 
There is no limits. I mean, you can apply a very large magnetic field. Yeah. It just sets the electron spin resonance to be at a very high frequency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one Tesla is 28 gigahertz. Okay. Uh, this is already not so easy to deliver RF at these, mm -hmm. at these uh, uh, frequencies. Something that we're looking at, uh, but will take a long time to develop, is using local oscillators to generate the RF rather than having to deliver it from externally. And these could be either done using, for example, a Josephson junction or spin torque oscillators. These are both systems that convert a DC current into an AC field mm -hmm. uh, and could locally then drive your, your NV center, which would make this technique operatable to very high frequencies, so uh, high magnetic field. Hertz. This could then operate at much higher. Yeah, Josephson junctions you can operate easily at several hundreds of gigahertz. Spin torque oscillators uh, also could be pushed to, to several mm -hmm. hundred gigahertz. Yeah. Josephson junction. What is, what, if there are any limits about the temperature? For this technique, uh, I you know the limit in te low temperature here or high temperature. This technique operates equally well between you know millikelvin to you know several hundred kelvin no 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 problems whatsoever no difference in fact you can gain a little bit uh if you work at low temperature because the emission lines become narrow you can invoke more sophisticated again measurement techniques to, to gain sensitivity what, what, are the what are the sources of noise uh, so there, there are a variety. Uh, so part of the reason to move to high frequency, of course, is that there are a lot of noise at low frequency. For example, if you're really measuring low magnetic fields, we've been easily able to detect the red line passing under Harvard Square. Uh, you know, huge current flowing through the, uh, you know, the, the engines there, and you can easily see, you know, very easy. So that would be a source of noise, very easy to get rid of by these echo techniques. Uh, normally, what will happen is that. I think it's really material specific. Uh, you have uh, dangling bonds on the surface, so just random paramagnetic spins that will create noise, uh, that will interfere. If you're studying magnets, then you can have thermal magnons. If you're not interested in the, if you're not inter if you're interested in the static magnetization, you have to worry about the fluctuations of these of this magnetization that will impede your ability to say something about magnetization. But I, I think generally it will be kind of problem specific. What are the noises? sources of noise. And you need the, your physics to be able to oscillate in this AC frequencies, uh, kind of gigahertz frequencies. Uh, so. so you'll see, I mean, depending on what you're interested in. So I'll show example of measuring DC magnetic field, that's for magnetization. For measuring uh, magnon chemical potentials, we're going to be looking at uh, gigahertz. Okay. Uh, for looking at hydrodynamics and graphene, we'll be looking at uh, several kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, some measurement modalities. Uh, here you can see, uh, you can sometimes, you can just take a slab of diamond that has one NV and you can deposit a material of interest directly on top of it. Uh, you won't be able to scan, but you're getting local information whose spatial resolution is given by this distance, assuming these are spins that are strongly interacting. Uh, and so this is a fairly easy experiment to do uh, that does not involve any scanning. Sometimes you cannot deposit the material of interest on diamond, so you want to bring the diamond to the material. Uh, so we have been uh, developing in collaboration with several groups at Harvard these prisms uh, that have one NV center in them, for example. And these prisms are very good because, again, they emit a lot of light in the direction that we care about. Uh, and so, uh, again, you get, you're sensing some property at some particular point uh, and you can get information locally this way. Uh, we talked about scanning and, of course, you can invert the process. So some of the experiments I'll talk about, we actually had a fixed NV on a pillar and then we patterned the sample of interest on a quartz tip. You see here about 50 microns. We did electron beam lithography on the tip to position these magnetic disks and scan them over our diamond tip. So all, all possibilities are there. All right, so as I mentioned, this is going to be the program in terms of experiments describing. We're going to be starting with uh, describing properties of static magnetization and how it relates to a measurement of magnetic field. 
Uh, I think we'll probably be end, end up ending up here today. Uh, next time I'll talk about measurement of magnetic fluctuations, magnons and their chemical potential, some transport measurements of spin excitations, and finally electrical measurements in graphene to determine uh, electron flow patterns. You can see here a two-dimensional image of the flow pattern, uh, but, and I'll talk much more about that in relation to what people have been describing here on graphene. All right, so the example that I like to talk about is, uh, let's see how much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay. So the example that I'd like to talk about is uh, that of skirmions. I'm not going to spend too much time giving background, only to say that these are magnetic textures. You can see that far away from this texture, magnetization is pointing up. In the middle, it's pointing down. And there is a particular way in which this magnetization is rotating from outside to inside. And in fact, one unique thing that will become very important later on when we try to infer or understand what it is that we're seeing is the fact that what's called the, the skirmions have a charge and that charge must be integer. And the way to understand the charge is to imagine a two-dimensional, a three-dimensional block sphere where each point on the sphere corresponds to an angle in three space. So the spin, all the spins out here which are pointing up will be mapped onto the North Pole, spins in the middle will be mapped onto the South Pole, and then each spin here that has a particular angle will be mapped on a particular point. And what one can show is that if this magnetization pattern is continuous, so the angle, always the angle between any neighboring spins is small, uh, then the coverage when you map the spin texture onto the sphere will always have an integer coverage either zero, which is a ferromagnet, all spins will map onto one point, or it will cover it precisely once, or twice, or three times. This charge has to be integer, and that's due to energetic reasons. And this will become really important when we try to actually determine what the structure is later on. And there are different types of skirmions, so the way the spins arrange themselves, for example, in the middle, between down to up, could either be in the plane radial or azimuthal, uh, and this is also something we'd like to be able to say is, okay, how is this pattern deviating? Quick background, uh, up until 2006, skirmions were believed to exist only in, as excitations. They were not even believed to be properties of ground states. Uh, this was the first paper to realize that spin-orbit interaction can stabilize skirmions in their ground state. Uh, and uh, the reason is that spin-orbit interaction leads to an exchange type interaction that is called anti-symmetric exchange, where the spins want to be perpendicular to one another rather than parallel or anti-parallel. And you can see just in mean field, if you had both exchange and the anti-symmetric exchange, and you just characterize the angle between them with some angle phi, it's very easy to see that the minimum energy here in mean field will correspond to a specific angle phi that's given by this anti-symmetric exchange prefactor d over the exchange interaction and the principal arrangement of spins will be a helical order. And then they were able to show that once you apply an external magnetic field you will favor one spin orientation versus the other and uh, skirmions will form. Today we know that you can even stabilize skirmions without an external magnetic field, especially in antiferromagnetic systems. So spin orbit interaction uh, requires breaking of inversion symmetry and uh, originally these skirmions were observed in bulk systems that have broken inversion symmetry but later on it was realized that you can also break the inversion symmetry through uh, an interface and so now a lot of the study and in particular applications are being explored in systems where you have uh, a combination of layers where one layer has no magnetism whatsoever, but has strong spin-orbit interaction, and another layer that has no spin-orbit interaction, but has only magnetism. And it turns out that at the interface, the, the, this anti-symmetric exchange uh, emerges, and the skirmionic textures will emerge because of the in breaking of inversion symmetry. And in fact, depending on whether you have bulk inversion or surface inversion, and anything in between, the textures will vary from what's called the block skirmions to nail, and that's partly what we were trying to determine. 
OK, uh, so this is one of these uh, disks that should have these skirmions. And this is a modality that I don't have time to describe, but it's a very qualitative way of measuring magnetic fields using NV centers just by looking at fluorescence. Uh, these are very, very quick measurements, but they're not quantitative. But they can easily tell you that they're a magnetic field uh, in, in the system and, and what their patterns look like. So at zero magnetic field, you see these kind of labyrinth domains. And as you apply the magnetic field, you see eventually the system forms a nice circular texture, which is a single skirmion. So now what we'd like to do is just zoom in onto that skirmion and do a quantitative measurement. So here is the, mag here is the frequency that we extract at each given point of where we are uh, resonant with the NV center. Uh, this is the lower transition, and this is the upper transition. And there is some math to convert from these two measurements, these absorption measurements, to what the magnetic field is parallel to the NV. And with lower resolution, lower sensitivity, the magnetic field perpendicular. This will become important later on just to convince ourselves that we know what it is that we're measuring. OK, so we have magnetic field. We're interested in magnetization. So the challenge is, OK, how do we go from one to the other? This seems like a very easy problem, but it turns out that it's not so easy. So let's start. Suppose I have a magnet who's uniformly magnetized, all spins pointing up. What is the magnetic field that we'll be measuring close to the surface? Zero. So this is an annoying fact. And the reason is that each one of these spins can be thought of as a small current loop. And when you add up all these current loops in the bulk, all the currents cancel. So the only place that current is actually flowing is the boundary. And since you're very close to this magnet and the boundary is very far away, you're not going to be picking up anything. So already you see that the envy center is not measuring magnetization. Here I have a sample whose magnetization is uniform and the signal is zero. So what is it that we're measuring? What is the magnetic field measuring in terms of magnetization? Well, if we had an antiferromagnet, we should be able to measure magnetic fields. The problem is that the wavelength of magnetization here is very short. It's on the atomic scale. And as we discussed, unless we're doing something really clever, we won't be able to resolve this wavelength f at a distance d greater than this wavelength. So intuitively, we can already see that the signal is 0 when the wavelength of magnetization is 0. Sorry, wave vector is 0. And it's also 0 when it's very large. And there is some peak. And the peak indeed occurs at 1 over the distance to the sensor. The fact that the, the signal rises linearly with k suggests that what actually the envy center is measuring is a gradient of magnetization. So this is what we're able to detect. Envy centers measure gradients of magnetization. Uh, and we always need to account for this filter function when we're trying to infer back from our measurements to what the magnetization is. So we can derive this uh, quite easily. Uh, here you can see, uh, let's say we take one spin and we ask, well, what is the magnetic field at the envy center position at point R0? There is a dipolar tensor. It's basically just the field generated by the spin uh, at point R prime uh, on a sensor at point R0. And this is the dipole of that moment. And we now can integrate over all generating spins to get what the total magnetic field is. And this is, of course, a convolution. And the nice thing is that if we Fourier transform this, we just get a nice product, where this is the dipolar tensor. We can calculate it. It'll show, you'll see it in a minute. This is magnetization. And so if we measured over a very large area in space, and we can Fourier transform into momentum space, we can easily inf invert this relation to get the magnetization from the magnetic field. But here's the problem. Here's the dipolar matrix. So this Fourier transform was in the plane. And uh, you see here, first of all, k is the uh, component. So this is in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, so here you see the prefactor, k e to the minus dk, that we kind of guessed before. And this is the dipolar matrix. Phi is the angle in Fourier space. 
And you should note that all these rows are linearly dependent on one, on, on the other. And this bears both good and bad news. The good news is that we know how to measure magnetic field easily along one axis. What that means is that we can now determine the magnetic field along all three axes just by measuring along one axis because they are all linearly related. We just need to multiply one of these rows by one of these prefactors, sine phi, in Fourier space, and we get the, the Fourier transform of the magnetic field along a different axis. So this is really nice and easy. So let's see how this works. So you remember, we know how to measure magnetic field along the NV axis from which, from this relationship now, we can compute magnetic field along, let's say, Cartesian axes X, Y, and Z. And from these three, we can now compute the field perpendicular to the NV, which we measure it independently. This is what we measured, and this is what we're inferring from the parallel component. And note that it contains exactly the same information, only this is much better because to measure magnetic fields perpendicular to the NV, we're very insensitive to it. We're sensitive to B squared because it's against the quantization axis. So this, this approach provides really a very nice way of getting vector magnetometry from one axis. We don't need to do anything else. Uh, and it works really well. We don't need to measure any other component of magnetic field. But where the challenge is, is that this singular dipolar matrix is a problem. All rows are linearly dependent, which means that this relation cannot be inverted. And this is not a mathematical problem. This is a fundamental problem. Turns out that there is an infinite set of magnetization patterns that produce precisely the same magnetic field in space. So based on this technique, just measuring magnetic field will never tell you what your magnetization is unless you invoke additional physics. And so in the context of what we talked about today, I'd like to invoke this charge, the topological charge, as a way of filtering out wrong solutions. Here's our measurement, and here's a magnetization pattern that produces this magnetic field in space, and note that we can make it to fit our measurement with any precision that you desire. It's going to fit perfectly well. The problem with this magnetization pattern is that when you map it onto the block sphere, it has a charge of about a half. This is unphysical. So these block-like skirmions here will not, are not the correct solution. Yeah. But make the charge uh, fractional. Uh, so the, the, the charge was an integer whenever the spin was uh, pointing uniformly in one, in one direction, very far away from the center, and exactly the opposite direction right. uh, uh, at the center. So what, what breaks? Uh, it's the center that's not pointing. Yes, here it's the center that's not pointing. You see that you have zero occupation of magnetization that's pointing opposite to the one in the outer direction. So it's a, this is allowed because it's on a lattice, or why? No, this is not a lattice. This is just a very coarse representation of the field of magnetization. So the, the but this is, this is the magnetization. If you want this texture, where the spins on the equator, when they're in the plane, are tangential, uh, what happens is that you can satisfy the magnetic fields that you need without arriving in the middle with a magnetization that points in the other side. But then and it's singular at the center, right? It's singular at the center. And that's why this solution is not a good one, because this costs a lot of energy. So it's saying the same thing. A fractional charge is unphysical, because there is a discontinuity somewhere in your magnetization pattern, and it just, the system will not do it. This is yeah. not the right solution. Yeah. Right. So here is a solution that is consistent with the measurement. You see that now spins are pointing radially. Now the charge is unit. And this is certainly a good solution. In fact, there are many solutions that are consistent. It doesn't isolate it precisely, but it can certainly eliminate a big class of solutions that will be inconsistent that have to do with this topological charge. OK, so at this point, I'd like to finish up, because I think I'm out of time, and just uh, say that uh, next time, we'll start looking at fluctuations talking about some hydrodynamics that have to do with uh, superfluidity of spin systems.
uh, talk about transport, and then I'll shift over to measuring orbital magnetic fields due to currents uh, to talk about hydrodynamics and graphene. Thank you. Can you comment on the sensitivity to electric fields? Yeah, so there are different modalities for measuring electric fields with NV centers. Uh, this is something that is of great interest to us because, as you very well know, there aren't really any probes that can give you good electrical, electric sensi sensitivity to electric fields or potential and also have very, very fine spatial resolution. This is, this is kind of a challenge. So NV centers have the spatial resolution, uh, but they're not very sensitive to electric fields. So one modality uh, is to look at the spin sector. So it turns out that if you're just looking at the level of the, of the spin state, the ground state manifold, it is sensitive to electric fields. And you can understand that from a second order perturbation theory where uh, the electric fields, you know, you need to invoke the dipole moment of the excited states that's sitting two volts away. So basically it's a very, you know, you have a huge energy denominator in that. But nonetheless, it gives you, I think, in terms of, um, uh, I, we, we can discuss what the value of electric field is, but I think you might be able to detect the electric field of a single electron, let's say, at a distance of a few tens of nanometers uh, with, that, with that technique. Uh, it turns out that you can get higher sensitivity to electric fields at precisely zero magnetic field, uh, and then from the spin manifold, uh, so that, but then you really need to be at zero. Anytime you apply some magnetic field, uh, the electric field sensitivity will drop rapidly. Uh, you can also work at low temperature using the excited state manifold. So the excited state has a large dipole moment of order one Debye. And so the energy levels of the excited state, they're moving quite significantly with electric field. And so if your lines are narrow as they are at low temperature, by exciting to the excited state, you can see changes in electric field that are, again, fairly sensitive. Uh, but it, it suffers from other complications. Uh, so the, I think these are the main modalities. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very kind of, it's something we're very interested in. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> I, I, at the very beginning of your talk, you made a comment about neutron scattering and skirmion physics. And as I heard it, I'm not sure I agree with it, because small angle neutron scattering was developed for vortices and superconductors and actually is used to very good effect to study skirmion physics. Almost certainly there will be many skirmion samples that you can't access with small angle neutron scattering uh, because they need a certain sample size and stuff for these technical things that uh, I'm not familiar with either. But I actually wonder whether some of the issues you're talking about here uh, in fact, if one could turn it around, a collaboration with neutron guys would be a pretty good idea because there's certain types of information they can get that may not be so easy. With. So I, I, I didn't stop at the slide that shows some of the bulk measurements that people have done, and indeed neutron scattering have been showing, have been showing it. I think the limitations there is that you're interested then in periodic structures of skirmions. No, that's uh, plenty, yeah. and, and where the field has really moved now are to these thin layers. We're there, you know, and, and the transport of skirmions driven by spin hall currents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, there's, so these are all non-ordered materials, usually sputtered, and also um, uh, non-ordered patterns. And also small angle neutron scattering, you need both. You need sort of no, you need big yeah. samples, yeah, clearly, yeah. Big samples and thick. Yeah. And so the skirmions have to be a sort of 3D object. Yeah. Um, so this problem that you mentioned about accessing the local magnetization from the magnetic field, if I understand correctly, this is a general problem for all magnetometry techniques. It is not only for NV techniques. For scanning discrete magnetometry, you have the same problem. Precisely the same problem. So it's a general is it, problem. Is it true that the reason magnetoencephalography didn't work was this exactly, in the sense that if you have the, the map of magnetic field, you cannot find is uh, you know, what happens really at a distance inside the brain because you see, you cannot make this hypothesis of what mapping is. Is that the same problem? It definitely, definitely is that. Uh, 
you know, there, there are limits in which this problem is, is resolved. For example, and, and we'll talk about it when we talk about graphene on Wednesday. There, you know, you can think of electrical currents as being as magnetization. Uh, if the magnetization is only along a single axis, so currents in the plane correspond to a spatially varying magnetization, but always pointing along z. This problem is completely invertible. One to one, measuring magnetic field will give you only one solution uh, for what the current patterns are. Now in the brain, you're right, because I have three-dimensional currents, so then the problem persists. So, so my question, so maybe you answered the question. So in other contexts other than experiments, then you don't have this you know, constraint on the topological charge. You can still get out of the problem if there is some boundary condition? So I think you need some additional physics. You, you really need additional physics that will distinguish between the, the various possibilities. Uh, and I, I, I can't think of another example. But for ex you know, if you know you have a magnet that uh, is subject to an external magnetic field and that um, you know, it's, it's uniform, somewhere in space, but the magnetization is all pointing in one direction. You just want to know what is the direction and what is the angle. Then under these assumptions, the problem is invertible because now you know I have a uniform magnetization, even though it's pointing somewhere in space. Uh, I, under these assumptions, there will be only one solution that has this property. Uh, but yeah, I think you need to invoke something more about the system in order to get the information that you're interested in. Yep. Can you use NV centers to measure local temperature? Yes, you can. Uh, it has been done. Uh, the nice thing about temperature is that whereas magnetic field shifts the plus and minus one levels this way, temperature shifts them this way. Right. Keeps the separation the same. It's strain, yeah. It's basically the formation of the lattice. So this technique works uh, as long as the lattice of diamond is sensitive to temperature, and that is true down to a few tens of Kelvin. So below that, it becomes extremely insensitive because the lattice just freezes and you have very little deformation. So you will not have temperature sensitivity uh, at very low temperature. But if you're at 100 Kelvin, you will have some decent temperature sensitivity. Uh, now you need a mechanism to couple your diamond to, uh, to the sample that you're interested in, uh, which is not and, and so easy. Temperature this way is still 50 minutes per pixel? Uh, I think it's about a millikelvin per root hertz. So nothing like what Ellie knows how to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not nearly as sensitive. There's okay. another problem of heat conductivity yeah. in diamond, which yeah. uh, would be an issue. Well, and l I mean, you can imagine having, I don't know, a nanocrystal of diamond. You just sit, and it just equilibrates to the. But yes, had many talks with Asaf about this. Are there any other uh, materials that give a uh, similar opportunity? You know, uh, Oh yeah, there are plenty. Actually, this is an entire field of what's called color centers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, silicon carbide, for example, is a system that has a defect uh, that both has a spin and has similar optical properties and, uh, and is being used. Uh, and people like it to a certain degree because it's compatible with silicon technology. Uh, you have, in diamond, you have other defects like germanium vacancies and silicon vacancies and lead vacancies and they're sensitive more to strain, you know, it, it's an entire, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big field. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. There are no more questions. Thank you.